Greetings everybody, Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John, I'm sorry, in John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul tells Timothy to study, not just read, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And of course, if you're a Baptist, uh, you believe that the what so-called dispensational theology is rightly dividing the word of truth, where they slice up the Bible into at least seven different time periods. But if you look up the word dispensation, it comes from the root word where you get the same word dispense. You ever heard of a soap dispenser? What does a soap dispenser do? Does it measure a period of time when it, when about soap? No, it... You go into the bathroom and you wash your hands, you know, and you put your hand under the soap dispenser and it gives you soap. Well, I only know two dispensations in the Bible. One was Moses, where he dispensed, was, uh, he dispensed the law. We, he was given the law and he gave the law to Israel from the Lord. And then Christ, who gave us grace and mercy and love. So, dispensation has nothing to do with a period of time. And those of you who think I'm some kind of Baptist heretic, well, you're probably right, because I went to one of their Bible colleges, and I have a master's degree from one of their Bible colleges. Yeah. I got a, got a bachelor's in uh, theology, and Christian education, and another one in ministry, a, a master's in ministry. So, yeah, I know exactly what they teach, which is why I went to Bible college in the first place, because you got to know what the, the lies are to teach the truth, so you can refute the lies. But, you know, that's what dispensation means. And you have the Old Dispensation, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and then you got the New Dispensation, the New Covenant, the New Testament. All right. One was Moses giving of the law, dispensed the law, and then Christ dispensed grace. So let's take a look at that real quick. You want to read about dispensations? Well, read in the book of John. Chapter 1 and verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Wow. So, Moses was given the law, and he gave the law when he came down from the mount, gave it to Israel. But Christ gave us grace. And some people want to take us back to Moses, but I try to bring everybody towards grace and truth by Jesus Christ. You know, Moses, I'm sure, hey, great guy, but, you know, you're not going to be saved by Moses and the law. Just not going to happen. So... All right, let's take a look at dispensation real quick. Uh, it appears four times in the Bible, all in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 9, 17, Paul writes, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation, which means to give, a dispensation of the gospel, the gospel is committed unto me. Ephesians 3, 2. If you have heard of the dispensation, the giving, the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Colossians 1, 25. 
whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given. I mean, come on, people. Where does this say period of time? Given according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Ephesians 1 and verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, you know, they could argue about time there, but he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So, there you go. All right, so this Bible study is going to be on day of the Lord versus the day of Christ. And to a dispensationalist, the day of the Lord is the destruction of the earth towards at the end of the tribulation period. And then they'll tell you that the day of Christ is the pre-trib rapture that happens before the well it's pre-trib rapture which they say happens before the tribulation but uh that's i don't know it just doesn't make any sense to me now if they say that the day of the lord and the day of christ is two different events are they not denying that Jesus Christ is Lord? I mean, day of the Lord and day of Christ. Oh, that's two different things. Oh, wait a minute, huh? But I don't think so. So is Jesus Christ Lord? Well, uh, only if you believe what Paul writes. Uh, you know, and this is why they, uh, Hebrew roots heretics, uh, hate Paul. Because Paul... Paul knew exactly what they teach, and Paul knows that they are a bunch of heretics. So, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. And by Corinth was a city-state in Greece. And Paul is probably writing to them and speaking to them in Greek. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Whereby, I'm sorry, wherefore, wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. And I say Jesus is the Lord. How about 1 Thessalonians 1.1? 1, 1? Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians Thessalonica was another city in Greece. Paul is preaching to the Greeks. Unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So is Jesus Christ Lord? I say yes, and I agree with Paul. So, second witness, James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? Hmm. How about John? Revelation 22, verse 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Yeah. So is Jesus Christ Lord? So saying that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is two different things, uh, to me anyways, it's like denying that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you got Paul, you got James, and you got John. All three say that Jesus Christ is Lord or Lord Jesus Christ. So let's take a look. Now, this is my take on it. There's two resurrections. All right, two of them. There's the first resurrection in Christ. And then they're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, where 
we are going to be, mm, how would you say, given rewards. Some people are not going to have very many, and others are going to have many rewards. It's sort of like uh, when you are in the army. You got privates, you got sergeants or corporals, privates, corporals, sergeants. Then you have officers who are ruling. You got lieutenants, captains, majors, colonels, and then generals. There's different ranks in the army. Well, there's going to be different ranks in the kingdom too. If you want to, you could read about the uh, the people that were given uh, the pounds. The guy that was given a pound and had 10 pounds, well, he's going to be given rule over 10 cities. He's going to be ruler. Where is that found? Let's take a look. All right, let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 19, words of Christ in red. Verse 12, chapter 19, verse 12. He, Jesus, he said, therefore, a certain nobleman. Now, remember, this is pertaining to Christ and how he's looking for, well, he's, this is going to apply to his apostles and his servants. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. See, this earth is Christ's kingdom, but he hasn't returned to reclaim it and rule and reign yet. Verse 13. And he called his ten servants. Why ten? I wonder if this has reference to the ten northern tribes of Israel that were divorced. I'm not exactly 100% sure, but certain numbers pop up in Scripture a lot. Uh, 1, 3, 10, 12, 24, and 40. Those numbers appear a lot in the Bible. You know, Christ fasted for 40 days. Noah's flood was for 40 days and 40 nights. The, the rain. Uh, you know, I... Uh, it, it, they come a lot. All right. And he, the nobleman, called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Uh, not abandoned like the modern so-called church world has. Uh, they've abandoned this church. The church world has abandoned this world to Satan and his minions. So, Christ said, Occupy till I come. Verse 14. But his citizens hated him. Wow. See, this nobleman went into a far country, heaven, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So, he called his servants, delivered to them ten pounds, and told them to occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him. Whoa. Most people hate Jesus. They don't want nothing to do with him. And sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. R-E-I-G-N. Ruling and reigning. Not water falling from the sky. Verse 15. And it came to pass that when he, Christ, was returned, Having, uh, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. Now I wonder, I don't exactly understand this, but I wonder if this is like in reference to winning souls to Christ I don't, yeah that's my guess Lord thy pound hath gained 10 pounds and he said unto me well thou good servant because thou hast been faithful in a 
very little, have thou authority over ten cities. You see, he's going to be a ruler over ten cities. Wow. That's like a general, huh? And the second came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five uh, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he, Christ, said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. Well, here's a colonel. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. You see, this one didn't do anything. He just took his gift and didn't do anything with it. Listen to what he says to Christ. He said, For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Austere means a hard man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And in other words, he's telling them, okay, you're taking things that you didn't put put down, uh, and you reap things that you didn't sow. That's like you went into somebody else's garden and you reaped all their fruit. They did all the work, but you took everything from them. Austere is a hard man. I mean, that's somebody calls you an austere person, that is not a compliment. I mean, think about it. You took that which you didn't lay down and you reaped you reaped that which you didn't sow? Really? Wow. You see, Jesus didn't preach to all these people. Paul preached to the apostles, and the apostles went to cities and they preached, and then you know, you take one seed and you'll get a plant, and you might get dozens of fruits and each one's got seeds and you take those seeds and plant those seeds and they produce even more it's it spreads and that's what christianity was uh they went to greece and when persecution came people fled all over the world and planted the seed of the gospel and it bloomed you know the church will Persecution will make, well, it'll separate the wheat from the tares, the weeds. Uh, the trouble is, in America, we haven't had persecution in centuries. Not since the Anglican Church of England, the Church of England, persecuted uh the people here that's why they said freedom of religion and when they were talking about freedom of religion they weren't talking about giving satanists the right to practice their religion okay they were talking about christians and i don't consider jehovah's witnesses and mormons christians so it's been abused so so this guy's saying well lord you took up that which you didn't lay down, and you're reaping that which you didn't sow. Well, that's true. The apostles and the people that listened to the apostles and had faith, and then they went and spread their faith to other people. Christ didn't plant those seeds, maybe indirectly. Verse 22, And he, Jesus, said unto him, out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. He was wicked because he was lazy. Thou knewest that I was an austere man? Oh, yeah? You think I'm a hard man? Really? Taking up that I laid not down and reaping what I did not sow? Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank? That at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. See, usury is against God's law. He's telling him he would have been better off to take his money and put it in the bank. 
to do something the Bible says not to do. Then what he did, he, he gave him a gift and he didn't do anything with it. Nothing. So what did Jesus say next? 24. And he, Jesus, said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Hmm. Remember, remember. Let's see. Let's take a look. Let's go back. Let's go back to verse 14. 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. Uh-uh. We don't want this. We don't want Christ as king. We don't want him as Lord. Uh-uh. No. Absolutely not. So let's go to verse 27. Well, 26. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. Listen to this, 27. But those mine enemies... Did you know Christ has enemies? Oh, yeah. But those mine enemies mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Boy, that doesn't sound like a loving Jesus Christ, does it? No. You don't want Christ as Lord and Savior? Well, the Lord says that those that I should, that would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Wow. That's some hard language there. You don't hear this stuff preached in churches, do you? No. Uh-uh, it's loving, kindness, Jesus. You know, they don't like to preach the Jesus going into the temple and overthrowing the temple tables in the temple and telling them that bought and sold that uh, ye have made, my, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Well, who do you think was in the temple? Yeah, not the Romans. Uh-uh. No, it was the other guys. Now, there are two different judgments in this, uh, in the Bible. There is the judgment of the, those that are in Christ. And then there's the judgment of those that are not in Christ. So, in Romans 14.10, Paul writes, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, you are going to st you're going to be before the judgment seat of Christ. But generally, if you're uh, well, anything that's at the end of the tribulation is going to be the judgment seat of Christ. That's for those that are in Christ. Those at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ who are resurrected after Christ returns and rules and reigns on the earth for a thousand years in glory, that's called the great white throne judgment. And if you're there, uh, you're heading to the lake of fire. Not good. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Remember the guy that had the 10 pounds? Remember the guy that had the 1 pound? Yeah, whether it be good or bad. 
Now remember, we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, if you ask me, Baptists that believe in dispensational theology, they're wrongly dividing the word of truth because they just, they, I don't know, they, they listen to so-called pastors that went to a Bible cemetery, I mean, sem seminary, cemetery, and, um, and then are taught by Satanists and unbelievers and yeah, anybody that believes that the Antichrist or God's chosen people are, uh, eh, what can I tell you? Oh, wait a minute. What, 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 Bob, what are you talking about? Antichrist. Oh, well, let's, uh, let's define what the word Antichrist, what, what is an Antichrist? Well, in the first book of John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Uh, what group of people is there that deny that Jesus is the Christ? Hmm. Well, I'd give you the answer, but I don't want to be accused of hate speech in my native state of Florida. Because evidently I can go to jail or prison for telling you who an Antichrist is and where they assemble themselves on the Sabbath day. Verse 23, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So if this certain group do not accept Jesus as Messiah, then who is their Messiah? Satan? In 1 Corinthians 16, 22, and this is why they hate Paul, Paul writes, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Anathema is a Greek word and it means cursed. Let him be anathema maranatha. Yeah, I think maranatha means right now. Is there a group of people that do not love Jesus? And are they cursed? Hmm. Good question. So, all right, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 20. Pre-trib rapture. Where the heck is the pre-trib rapture? I can't find it anywhere in my Bible. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. Hmm. Oh, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Do you know there's going to come a time when Satan is bound for a thousand years? Yeah, verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. Uh, this is what people call the millennium. Uh, Milli is where you get, uh, it's a Latin word, it means thousand. You ever heard of a millimeter? Like nine millimeter? Yeah. Nine one thousandths of a meter. So there's going to be a thousand years when Satan is bound. Uh, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment, judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them, the souls of them that were beheaded, beheaded, cut off by a guillotine. 
And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast. You don't worship the beast, you're going to get your head cut off. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So those that are in Christ that were beheaded and those that died before are going to be resurrected before uh, the thousand years, at the beginning of a thousand years, approximately. Verse 5. But the rest of the dead live not again. This is the unbelievers, those that are not in Christ. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Pre-tribbers will tell you, uh, no, 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 no. The first resurrection is the pre-trib rapture before the tribulation. And then these that died during the tribulation, well, that must be the one and a half resurrection. Or, you know, first resurrection part B, I guess. You know, the pre-trib rapture is part A, and then I guess the this is part B. I don't know. Uh, where do they come up with this mental gymnastics? I It's got to be from Satan, because, you know, the, if, if there's a first resurrection, there has to be a second one. Okay? I mean, the first letter in the alphabet in the English language is A. The next one is B. There's not a A1 and one and a half or a, a and a half. No. So you're either in the first resurrection or you're in the second resurrection. So those that didn't worship the beast are going to be beheaded for the witness of Christ. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Can there be a pre-trib rapture resurrection before the first resurrection? Uh, no. Verse 6, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. What do you mean second death? There's physical death, and then there's spiritual death. Think about it. You can, you can, your body can die, but your soul and spirit doesn't die. Unless you're a Jehovah's Witness. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hmm. Rulers and reigning with Christ a thousand years. Verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Boom. All the wicked are burned up. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. That's the unholy trinity. The devil, the beast, and the false prophet. You got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost. Well, here you have the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. Oh, yeah. The unholy trinity. See, Satan can only counterfeit what God creates. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, 
where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Wow, that's a long time, huh? Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. The books, plural, were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? I certainly hope so. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. See, our works don't determine uh, our salvation. You know, they don't. In Galatians 2.16, Paul writes, Knowing that a man is not justified, justified by the works of the law. No, our justification comes in the work that Christ did on the cross and our faith in him. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified, justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. James 2.18 Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You see, what you do will depend upon what you believe. So, if you are truly in Christ, you're going to bring forth good works. So, uh, let's see. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we read, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. See, your works don't determine your justification and your salvation. But if you are saved, you will bring forth good works. Good works, you know, an apple tree doesn't produce apples to be an apple tree. An apple tree produces apples because it is an apple tree. And an apple tree that doesn't produce apples is good for nothing and needs to be cut down, thrown into the fire. At least it'll be good for heating the fireplace and the home in the winter, right? so that a, a, a tree that bears apples can be planted in its place, so you can have fruit. Well, yeah. All right, let's go back to 18. Uh, Revelation 20 and 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, the book of life, and I guess you could say the book of death, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Uh, the wicked are going to be judged by their works, and so are the just, those that are justified in Christ. See, though him that had gained ten pounds will be over ten cities. He that gained five, well, he's going to have five cities. Our rewards are going to be judged by what we did with our gifts that the Lord gave us. Think about it. Privates, corporals, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, majors, colonels, generals, right? Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Boy, I'll tell you what, the Pacific is going to have a lot of dead raised from it. World War II, people. 
all the submarine uh, submariners that are on eternal patrol, all the surface ships where sailors lost their lives in World War II fighting the Japanese Empire. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Oh, yeah. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The first death is your physical body. The second death is your soul and spirit. Verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So I guess you could call that the book of death. See, the judgment seat of Christ is for believers. The great white throne judgment is you miss the bus and you're left behind. Yeah. Yeah, I... Uh, yeah, something like that. Do you know that there is sin? Now, what is sin? According to the Bible, sin is transgression or breaking of the law. Uh, I guess I need to look that up. So nobody can say, ah, Bob, you're just making this stuff up as you go. No, I'm not. I try not to. You know, when the Bible's clear on something, I just tell you what it says. And when it's kind of foggy, you know, I, I give you my opinion, but I tell you what my opinion is. All right? And if you believe different, well, you know, I understand. I mean, if I ever get it figured out, I'll let you know. But until then, uh, you know, some things I know and some things I kind of guess. But, you know, I don't try to deceive people on purpose, like uh, TBN pastors. All right, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. You kill somebody, that's transgressing the law. You cheat on your spouse, that's transgressing the law. That's sin. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. So, all right, so let's, uh, there is sin, and then there's the greater sin. So let's go to John chapter 19. Verse 1, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Purple is the color of royalty. They're mocking him. And said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. They're smacking him around. Pilate therefore went forth again and said, saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Uh, who's trying to kill Jesus here? Does it sound like Pilate's trying to kill him? No. The you-know-whos, I'm afraid to even say this word on you-know-who tube. The you-know-whos answered him, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. You better believe that Pilate had spies following Jesus around, because, I mean, you know, he's, he's growing these crowds of thousands of people clamoring to hear Jesus speak, and Pilate had to be worried that Jesus was going to maybe do a revolt. 
you know, thousands of fo people following him, right? You better believe Pilate had spies following Jesus. And they've had to be reporting back to him. Uh, there was a guy that was blind and he says now he can see. And there was a guy that was crippled and we saw his shriveled legs restored and he started walking. And I've known this guy since he was a child. You know, and Jesus is performing all these miracles and Pilate's probably hearing this from, you know, several people that don't even know each other. I mean, you'd be stupid to send out spies that all know each other. No, no, you want these spies to not know each other so they can't communicate with each other. So, you know, trust me, Pilate sent spies out to, to watch Christ because he didn't want any insurrections. He didn't want to revolt. So, you know who's answered and said, we have a law. And by our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. And Pilate's like, whoa, this guy was healing the sick and raising the dead. And uh, he said he's the son of God. Verse 8, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Pilate was afraid. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Wow. See, there's a sin, and then there's a greater sin. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee, you know, the guy that delivered me to unto you, hath the greater sin. And from thence forth, Pilate sought to release him. You ever heard that lie that it was the Romans that killed Christ? Wow. See, this is why they fight against the King James. You'll always hear people saying, oh, the King James, it's a bad translation. We have older, more reliable manuscripts because they don't want you to read this stuff. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him, but the you-know-whos, and I'm afraid to even say that word, but the you-know-whos cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. See, they are telling Pilate. Pilate wants to release him. But they're saying, oh, you let this guy go? We're going to accuse you before Caesar of treason and sedition, since Christ says he's a king, which, you know, Christ is a king, but this earth right now is not his, earthly, his, his kingdom. When Christ returns, it'll be his kingdom, but right now, no. If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Wow. All right, so. Let's take a look at Mark chapter 12. And verse 38. And he, Jesus, saith unto them in his doctrine... Beware of the scribes. Who are the scribes? Um, well, scribe is where we get the word scribble. You know, it means to, to write. Uh, the scribes were the ones who hand copied the Bible. They didn't have printing presses back then. So if you wanted a copy of the Bible, you had to probably hire a scribe to 
write you a copy of the Bible. And that's what they were. They were the copyists of the law. And you better believe these people knew the letter of the law. They may not have known the spirit of the law, but they knew the letter of the law. And they would have to write them on, you know, animal skins or uh, different things. You know, they didn't have moderate paper like we do today. But Jesus said, Beware of the scribes, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the sin of gogs and the upper uppermost room at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Greater damnation. How are they devouring widows' homes? Well, they would call the religious people into their, uh, let's say a, a widow, uh, her husband just was getting ready to, do, to die and he's in his deathbed. And the widow calls the religious person. And by the way, the, the Vatican, the Catholic priest did the same exact thing as the people I'm talking about in here do. So, the owner of the house, the husband, is on his deathbed. He's getting ready to die. And the widow, well, the soon-to-be widow calls the priest or whoever and says, please pray for my husband. So the guy comes, tells everybody, leave the room. I'm going to pray for this guy. So everybody leaves. And for a pretense, make long prayers. Hmm. Well, after the guy kicks the bucket, he dies. He comes out of the house, uh, out of the room, and says, "Oh, by the way, before he died, he left the house, this house, to the church, or the uh, people that were before the church." Yeah. They devoured widows' houses. So the widow and her children got kicked to the curb, homeless. Yeah. Which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive the greater damnation. Do you know that the um, Catholic Church had done this so many times in England that the people rose up and demanded that real estate, like a home, could not transfer property without at least the owner, a notary, and two witnesses. You ever go to a house closing? There had to be the owner, the buyer, a notary, and two witnesses. None of this the Catholic priest walks out of the room and says, Oh, the, your husband gave us the house before he died. So you, a uh, widow, and your kids, get out. This is where, this is why you have to have notarized for the property. This comes back to what this verse 40, Mark 12, verse 40, which devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Oh, yeah. So there's damnation and there's greater damnation. There's sin and then there's a greater sin. I wonder if there's levels of hell. Uh, you know, there's the hot section and then there's the extra hot section. I don't know. Wouldn't surprise me. So, and just so you know, people, uh, let's see, today is December 30th, yeah, um, 2023, um, I got a strike on uh, you-know-who-tube, 
and uh, couldn't post. And you know what? I didn't even use the uh, three-lettered word that rhymes with news, you know, like the newspaper or the TV news. Um, and there's a certain letter, uh, you know, what comes after A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, the next letter that comes after that. I just mentioned that that letter, um, the that letter owned the telecommunication companies and that they were going to fine people for wrong think. And I posted somebody else's video to my community page with those words and you know who tube gave me a week suspension i didn't even mention that three letter word um i mean censorship is getting bad i mean bad so and plus florida has a law that our uh, governor ron de satanist uh he actually went to the israeli state and signed this bill making um speaking about a certain group of people, illegal. So Voltaire is uh, credited with saying that if you want to know who rules over you, find out who you're not allowed to criticize. And I have a pretty good idea. So, but uh, this is going to be part one of uh, Day of the Lord versus the Day of Christ. Now, let's sum this up. There's going to be two resurrections. Revelation chapter 20. There's the first resurrection, and then there is the second resurrection. The first resurrection happens at the end of the tribulation. The second resurrection happens at the end of a thousand years when Satan is loosed again. And there's two judgments. The first one is the judgment seat of Christ for the believers who are justified by faith. And then there is the great white throne judgment where those that are not covered by the blood of Christ are, well, let's just say it's the lake of fire. Now let's take a look at Revelation chapter 7, and I guess we'll close this out. Um, verse 9, Revelation 7 and verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, white robes, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered saying unto me so he's asking a question here what are these which are arrayed you know clothed what are these which are arrayed in white robes so hey who are these people with these white robes and whence came they so who are these people in the white robes and where did they come from verse 14 and i said unto him sir thou knowest you know, hey, what are you asking me for? You know the answer to this question, right? And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. See, they have covering for their sins, people. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, waters, and God shall wipe away all tears 
from their eyes. No more tears. And sorry, that's not referring to Ozzy Osbourne. In Revelation 19, verse 8, And to her was granted, granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. I love Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. Are you covered in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, I hope so. All right, let's go to Matthew 22. I'm getting ready to close this out. Verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, God the Father, right? Which made a marriage for his son which is Jesus Christ. And who's this marriage to? Israel, God's people. And it's we're not talking about the Antichrist over in the Middle East. No, we're talking about God's people under Christ. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. See, they, wouldn't, they, they didn't want to believe in Christ. They didn't want to be ruled and reigned by Christ. They don't want Christ as king. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, the marriage supper of Christ. I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, the apostles, the prophets. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Slew them. He killed them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He was mad. He was angry. And he sent forth his armies, his army of angels, and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Sodom and Gomorrah, anyone? Oh, yeah. Verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out unto the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. This guy is at the wedding, but he doesn't have a wedding garment. He's not covered with a white robe washed in the blood of Christ. Verse 12. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The guy couldn't talk because he, had, he couldn't say anything. Not because he was mute. No. There was no words that he could give the, for an answer. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So how did this guy get into the wedding? Well, John chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door, Remember, Jesus says, I am the door. He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. See, he's climbing over the fence. He's not going in by the door. He's climbing up over the fence. He that entereth 
not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. You want to go through the door, that's Christ. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his, his, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. TBN is full of them. I am the good shepherd and, I, and know my sheep and am known of them. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. There you go, people. Jesus is the shepherd. Jesus is the door. All right, uh, this is part one of the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. I think I've laid the foundation, and uh, I hope you've learned something. And uh, I'm getting to the point I'm not going to, don't think I'm going to be able to point, uh, post anything more to uh, You Know Who Tube because of the horrible. I call it sin sirship, but uh, what do I know? So, all right. Um, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, here in South Florida, today is January 1st, 2024. I suspect this might be our, the last, the last, quote, good year, unquote. But I don't know. Of course, I've been saying that for a while. Uh, it's past midnight, so I guess it's, yeah, it's New Year, so according to the, what is it, the Gregorian calendar or whatever, I don't know. God's calendar was, uh, the beginning of the year was the spring. Uh, Passover was 14 days after the beginning of the new year. But, uh, the world's calendar is, you know, the beginning of winter. I don't know. Winter is when things die. God's calendar of spring uh, plants spring to life. It's 
quite a contrast when you think about it. But this is going to be part two of uh, Day of the Lord versus the Day of Christ. And if you are a dispensational Baptist, uh, like the Bible college that I attended, they'll tell you that the Day of the Lord is the when the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation to punish the wicked, and they'll tell you the day of Christ is the pre-trib rapture, which happens before. I believe we laid the foundation of that, a lot of that in part one. But uh, I'm going to take a look at when is the resurrection of Christ. We're going to take a look at that. Because it makes a difference if it's at the beginning of the tribulation or if it's at the end. And those that believe in the pre-trib rapture, well, they have to believe it's at the beginning. But the church, originally, they never saw it. So let's go and take a look and see what's happening. So, all right, so let's take a look. When is the rapture, which is the resurrection? The rapture is the resurrection. Uh, I prefer to use resurrection, but modern demon nominational churches call it the rapture. So, when is this? Well, in Revelation chapter 20, verses starting in verse 4 there are only two more future resurrections spoken of and this is after the two witnesses appear and the two witnesses appear one of them is going to be elijah the other one is kind of open for debate some people say enoch others say uh uh moses i uh, you know i don't know we'll see all right, so Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither have received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Hmm. Now let's do a thought here. If the pre-trip rapture happens prior or just you know the man of sin the antichrist the beast whatever you want to call him appears and then as soon as he appears the resurrection happens the rapture happens what about all these people that died during the tribulation period what they missed the marriage supper of the lamb or do they come in in the middle of the the supper you know what's up with that is this marriage supper going to be three years long? You know, 42 months? Uh, I think the Bible says the reign of the man of sin, the Antichrist, the beast, as John calls him in Revelation, is 42 months in one place. And I think it's 1,260 days in another place, which is roughly three and a half years. So... Uh, when is, you know, these people that die getting beheaded during the tribulation period, what, are they, they miss the, uh, they miss the resurrection? Really? Well, we're going to find out that that is a lie. It can't be that way, according to the Bible. So let's read it again. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and ju judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. 
and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in the hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, the unsaved, but the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Ah, oh, wait a minute. How can the pre-trib rapture happen and when the rest of these people are being beheaded and killed for the witness of Jesus? You know, it just doesn't make any sense, people. You know, listen to this. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay, you know, uh, if there's only two resurrections, the resurrection of those in Christ, and then a thousand years later, the resurrection of those that are not in Christ, the unsaved, uh, you know, it, there can only be two of them. And if people are dying in the tribulation period, how can the resurrection happen before the tribulation period? That is impossible. It has to happen after. There's only two resurrections. There's not two and a half. So in the above scriptures, there are the martyrs. John said, this is the first resurrection. John didn't say this is the second phase of the first resurrection, as pre-tribbers like to lie about and claim. And if the pre-trib rapture is wrong, do you realize that every single pastor, preacher that teaches this stuff will be found to be a false prophet? And let me tell you something, people. God hates false prophets. And if these people were earnestly looking for the truth, God would reveal it to them. So if this is the first resurrection, can there be a resurrection before this one? Uh, no. The first resurrection is of the dead in Christ. And the second resurrection is after a thousand years later. Paul wrote that the dead in Christ must rise first. The dead in Christ must rise first. So if Christians are dying in the tribulation, and there's only one resurrection, it has to be at the end. You can't have the resurrection before the people are dying during the tribulation. It can't happen before if people are in are in Christ and being resurrected prior to this happening. It has to be at the end. So Paul wrote that the dead in Christ must rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now remember something. If you are not caught up into the clouds, in the air, in the clouds, to meet Christ in the air, it's the wrong Messiah. All you have to do is look to the Middle East, to a people that want to build a temple, and whoever they say the Messiah is, well, if you're not caught up in the air to meet him in the air, it's the wrong one. That's all I can say. And because of the extreme hate speech laws that recently were passed in Florida. Um, I got to be careful what I say. And YouTube. Thank you, YouTube. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So if people are dying in the tribulation... And there's only one first resurrection. 
then it has to be at the end. It can't happen at the beginning and then people are being resurrected later. There's only one resurrection for the just and another one for the unjust. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. In Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5, John sees the souls of the saints who were beheaded for refusing the mark of the beast during the Great Tribulation. John writes that they will rise and reign with Christ for a thousand years and that this is the first resurrection. If according to John, the, resur the, if according to John, the beheaded rise in the first resurrection... And Paul says that those who are alive and remain are not caught up until after the dead in Christ are resurrected, resurrected. Then this means the catching up or rapture takes place after the tribulation. It can't happen before. It's impossible. Now compare the above that I mentioned, the previous that I mentioned with 1 Corinthians 15, Verses 20 through 23. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of those who slept. Or slept meaning died. For since by man came death, and by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's, at his coming. Notice only one resurrection of the dead in Christ is mentioned here, which according to Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 must take place before we who are alive and remain are caught up with them. When did Jesus say the dead in Christ would be resurrected? Oh, well, maybe we should ignore Paul and read what Jesus said. John chapter 6, verses 39 and 40. Jesus said, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Uh, the last day of this wicked earth. John 6, 44. Jesus said, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Raise him up? Raise him up for what? From the dead. Is the last day the beginning of the thousand year reign of Christ? I think so. Then it will become eternity and time is counted no more. So if Jesus himself said the dead in Christ will be raised on the last day, and Paul said we who are alive and remain shall not be caught up, or raptured until after the dead are raised, then where does the secret pre-trib rapture fit in? It doesn't. It's a lie. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, writes, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, at the last trump, at the last trump, and not Donald either. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So we are changed at the last trump, and where is this found? Oh, I know where it's found. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, there are seven trumps, and the seventh trump is the last one, okay, can you, can you count them? Trump, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's not an eighth one. So which one's the last one? Number seven. The seventh Trump is the last one. Is at the end of the tribulation. There is not a seventh Trump prior to the tribulation like pre-trib rapture liar deceivers and false prophets teach. So, I mean, come on, people. Look it up. All right, let's take a look at the wheat and the tares. 
All right, let's go to Matthew 13, uh, verse 24. Another parable put he, Jesus, put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So the Lord is likening the kingdom of heaven to a farmer that is planting good seeds in his field. Verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, or weeds, and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, I did a four-part series on the wheat and the tares. Kudos to Pastor Dan Gaiman. Um, but uh, about the uh, what the tares are. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So here it is, the wheat comes up, but so are the weeds. And if you know anything about the tares in the Middle East, uh, it's called the bearded darnel. Uh, it looks exactly like wheat. Matter of fact, you can't tell them apart until harvest time. Unless, of course, you did a genetic study test. But, you know, back in the time of Christ, you know, they weren't doing that stuff. So, but uh, until it becomes, the wheat starts producing wheat kernels, you can't tell them apart. They look identical. But the difference is, wheat, you can make bread. And the bearded darnel seeds are poisonous. Yeah. Wheat and the tares, people. It's a good Bible study. It's in my playlist. Um, yeah. It's worth listening to. My opinion. But I'm kind of prejudiced. Um, verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares or the weeds also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? Hey, uh, didn't you sow, sow uh, good seed in your field? Where did all these weeds come from? Dude, man. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we gather, go and gather them up? Hey, uh, you want us to go gather them weeds up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Listen to this carefully. Let both grow together. Let both grow together, the wheat and the tares, until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares. Gather ye together first the weeds. Who gets gathered first? The weeds get gathered first. Isn't that the exact opposite of what the pre-trib rapture teaches? Yes. Uh, these are words of Christ in red. So are you going to tell me that the pre-trib rapture people have it right and Christ is wrong here. Oh, Jesus, you got the timing wrong. No, no, no. The wheat's going to go up in the pre-trib rapture. <laughs> and then the tares are going to be burned. Uh, I don't think so. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares. Gather ye together first the weeds. And bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Hmm. Wow. Let's skip down to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare, or explain, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He, Jesus, answered and said unto them, 
He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Now remember, Christ created everything. Who is the good seed? Adam. Verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares, the weeds, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The evil gets gathered first and burned, people. The pre-trib rapture is a lie. Verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So did Jesus get it wrong? Or are the preacher of rapture crowd a bunch of lying devils? I hope you know which it is. All right. Let's take a look at the day of the Lord versus the day of Christ. Now, let me explain to you what I think it is. There's only two types of people in this world. You ever heard that before? There's two types of people in this world. Those in Christ and those without Christ. Those in Christ, the day of the Lord is not for them. For them, it's the day of Christ. But the day of the Lord is for those that are without Christ. So the day of the Lord is from the perspective of those who are unsaved, wicked people who have not repented and not do not have faith in Christ. The day of the Lord is punishment for the wicked do evildoers. The day of the day of Christ is going to be our day of redemption. Think about it. So let's. So when people tell you that the day of the Lord and day of Christ is two different events, basically what they're doing is denying that Jesus Christ is Lord. Think about it. All right, let's take a look at where the day of the Lord is. Isaiah 2.12 For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud, God hates pride, people. If it's one sin that I don't have, it's pride. Believe me, I am not proud. I've done so much evil in my past, I remember it, and I will never, God willing, I'll never be proud. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. Where's hell? Hell is beneath, people. Yeah, he's going to be brought low. Isaiah 13, 6. Howl ye. You ever heard of people howling for pain? Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall, destroys, he shall destroy the sinners, sinners thereof, out of it. Wow. Isaiah 34, 8. Have you people ever read the bother to read the book of Isaiah? Isaiah is a wonderful book. There's more messianic... Uh, well, I, I think there's more messianic prophecies in Isaiah than any other book. 
Don't quote me on that, but I think it's true. But Isaiah is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Believe me. When, uh, when Jesus first went to the uh, temple and, and read from the uh, scrolls, and, uh, oh, I'm going to have to look this up. All right, Luke chapter 4, four verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout, uh, through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is the Greek rendering of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. Physically blind or spiritually blind? To set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. See, this is right out of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is quoted many, many, many times uh, in the New Testament. All right, so let's uh, let's see. Let's go to Isaiah thirty-four eight. Day of the Lord, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. And the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Recompense, uh, payback. You know, the Lord's going to pay back the wicked for their evil. Let's go to Jeremiah 46.10. For this is the day of the Lord, God of hosts. A day of vengeance. See, believers are not, we're not, we're not under God's wrath. Now, we can, we are going to get judgment. Believe me. Uh, the churchgoers and, and, well, the true Christians are going to suffer for tolerating evil. Oh, yeah, we're going to suffer for tolerating evil. But it's not going to be the Lord doing it. It's going to be the devils and his children doing it. God does not want his people tolerating evil. Tolerate, tolerating evil is not a Christian virtue. I know people argue, but it's not. For this day is the late day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. Do you know God has enemies? Oh, yeah that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it shall satiate and make drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Lamentations 2.22 Thou hast called as in a solemn day my terrors, my terrors round about, so that in the day of the Lord's anger, none escaped nor remained. Those that I have swaddled and brought up hath mine enemy consumed. Ezekiel 13.5 This is, could apply to the modern day church. Ye have not gone up into the gaps. Um... What are they talking about going up into the gaps? Well, when you, I, those of you that were in the military, you'll have a battle line. And 
if you have an opening in that battle line, the enemy can pour through and start attacking people from the sides and the rear, which is not good because you can only face one direction at a time. So if you're fighting, one person's fighting three people, one in the front, one in the back, and one in the side, you're dead. And God's people were supposed to stand in the spiritual gap of the battle line, but they're not doing that. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge, a hedge of protection, for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. People, we're in a battle. And most churches are absolutely worthless. Well, they call themselves churches. They're 501c3. That's an IRS regulation, by the way. 501c3 tax-exempt businesses chartered in the state that they're in, given a tax-exempt uh, charter by the IRS. And to keep that charter, they have to not talk about anything against public policy. So if the government says that uh, men that like to do men like they would a woman um, are allowed to get married, well, and the state will sanction it, uh, the church has to remain silent on that or they're going to lose their tax-exempt status. But if you look them up, they're just basically a business with the name church in it. So, sort of like uh, calling FedEx, Federal Express, part of the federal government. They're not. So, Ezekiel 30, verse 3. For the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day, a cloudy day, Remember, the Lord's going to be coming in the clouds. I did an entire playlist on clouds. Yeah, Christ is going to be coming in the clouds. Uh, and it's going to be a cloud of witnesses. Even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. Book of Joel, chapter 1, verse 15. Alas, for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction, as a destruction from the Almighty, it shall come. Joel 2, 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Oh, the last trump, remember? There are seven trumps in Revelation? Oh, yeah. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Joel 2.11 And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Wow! The Lord has an army. Yeah. Did you know the Lord has an army? You didn't. Well, I did. Matthew 12, Matthew 26, uh, verse 47. Now, Jesus is in, the, is in the garden. He's getting ready to be arrested and taken away uh, to be tried and crucified. Verse 47, Matthew 26, 47. And while he, Jesus, yet spake, lo, Jesus, Ju lo Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with sword and staves, from the chief priests and elders of the people. These were not Roman soldiers. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. The kiss of death. You ever wonder where the uh, mafia had their little kiss of death came from? Here you go. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came and laid whole hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests 
and smote off his ear. Cut off his ear. Um, by the way, uh, when you read another uh, gospel, you will find out that this was Peter. Peter did this. I guess he was trying to cut off his head, and the guy probably ducked or moved, and, and he only got his ear. Verse 52. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Uh, when you read another gospel account, P, uh, Jesus touched this guy's ear and healed him. Can you imagine that? You get your ear cut off, you're sitting there looking at it on the floor, and Jesus touches your ear and it's you're back to normal. And you're you're gonna you're gonna arrest this guy to take him to be killed? Are you nuts? So then said Jesus unto him, Put it put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Now this is Jesus speaking, verse 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father? And he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions of angels. From what I understand, a legion was about two to 3,000 men. So how many, how many 12 legions? So that's 24 to 36,000 angels. An army, people. And a legion was an army group, okay? I mean, God has an army. He shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Oh, yeah. Jesus ain't playing around. Listen to this. In 2 Kings 19.35, And it came to pass that night, now I should tell you, the Assyrians had conquered uh, Israel in the north. And then they went to the southern part of the kingdom and they had surrounded Jerusalem and they were sieging Jerusalem. They were surrounded Jerusalem. Nobody got in, nobody got out. And let me tell you what, when you're in a city and you're surrounded by the enemy, uh, you're not going to be able to go out and collect food. You're not going to be able to go out and collect water. Whatever you got in the city, that's all you got. And when it runs out, you starve. Uh, or you die of dehydration or whatever. A siege is very, very dangerous. So here is the Assyrian army had besieged Jerusalem. So 2 Kings 19.35, And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord, one angel, that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and hundred four score and five thousand. That's a hundred and eighty-five thousand troops. That is one large army, people. And when they rose up early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. One angel killed a hundred and eighty-five thousand soldiers. One. What do you think twenty-four thousand angels could do? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think they can kick some booty. What do you say? What do you say? Joel 2.11 And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army and his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible and who can abide it? Is the day of the Lord going to be terrible for those that are in Christ? No. It's going to be terrible for the unbelievers. Joel 2.31 The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the same exact language, the sun being turned to darkness, the moon into blood. Um, I think it's in Matthew 24 also, or Mark 13 or Luke 21, if I remember correctly. But this is a sign. 
that people will know that the day of the Lord is coming. Joel 3.14. And we just read Joel 2.31. Now we're going to read Joel 3.14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Amos 5.18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Why? Because they don't have Jesus, who is the light of the world. Amos 5.20. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Book of Obadiah 1.15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, not believers, the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Zephaniah, Z-E-P-H-A-N-I-A-H, 1-7. I always get Zechariah and Zephaniah mixed up. But we're looking at Zephaniah with a P. Z-E-P. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests. Hmm. Zephaniah 1.8. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. Why are they in strange apparel? You know, apparel is just a fancy word for clothing. You see, they're not, they don't have on a wedding garment for the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, the robes with white washed in the blood of the Lamb that was in the previous study. So they are clothed with strange apparel. Zephaniah 1.14 the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly because they're going to be destroyed. Zephaniah 1.18 Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Trust me, you're not going to be able to bribe the Lord with gold and silver. Hey God, I'll give you a ton of gold if you... Uh, let me pass on all my sins. Uh, nope. Neither their gold, neither their silver, nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance. You ever heard of good riddance? A speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. God's going to get rid of the evildoers. Zephaniah 2.2 Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Verse 3 Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. Good advice. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be that ye shall be hid. It may be that ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. That's what we're looking for. We want to be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. We want to be in Christ. Zechariah, Z-E-C-H-A-R-I-A-H. Not Zephaniah, Zechariah 14.1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Malachi 4.5. 4, uh, 4, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. See, Elijah is going to come. Now, there's going to be the uh, false prophet. And I believe the false prophet for the Antichrist 
is going to claim to be Elijah. So you're probably going to have two guys running around claiming to be Elijah. Acts chapter 2 and verse 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Isn't this what we read in Joel? Absolutely. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great notable day of the Lord come. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Day of the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1, 14. As also you have acknowledged us in part, that we are, re that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Day of the Lord Jesus. See, day of the Lord, destruction of the wicked, but the day of the Lord Jesus, or the day of Christ, is for those that are saved. Think about it. You want to be in the day of Christ. First Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 2 Peter 3.10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Fire, baby, fire. All right, uh, Matthew 12, 36, Jesus speaking. But I say unto you that every idle work that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And that's for the believers and the unbelievers. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne... Now, this is the great white throne judgments for the unbelievers. And him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Not in the kingdom. Their place is going to be in the fiery lake, the lake of fire. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring the light, the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. If you're in Christ, right? So, Romans 14.10 But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not the great white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Where he's going to say, okay, you did this bad thing, you did that bad thing, but you did this good thing, you did this good thing. And then you will get your reward or lack thereof. If you read the first chapter of the book of Revelation, Jesus said, okay, churches, this church, you did this good, but you did this thing, you're lacking. And... Uh, he didn't have very many good things to say about Laodicea. So, yeah. Romans 9.27 And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Matthew 24.36 But of that day... An hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. John 12, 48. Jesus speaking. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in 
the last day. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 21 and verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. All the wicked, evil stuff's going to pass away, people. Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Revelation 20 and verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. You ever seen people doing charity work on TV and... They're bragging about, oh, I gave all this money to, you know, this homeless cause. You know, because they want the praise of men and people to think how great they are. Uh, and then you find out that the charity pays the top guy a million dollars a year, you know, and a thousand dollars goes to the, uh, <laughs> to help the homeless. You know, all the money goes to the uh, board members. Yeah. They're not going to have any reward, trust me. Matthew 7, 2, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Do you condemn somebody because they drink, but you smoke? Uh, don't do that. Not a good idea. You know, well, I only drink a little wine, you know, and they drink too much hard liquor. Yeah, but you both drink. And I'm not saying drinking's bad, you know. I mean, I like to have a glass of wine every once in a while. I did a wedding at uh, Trump's uh, uh, golf club once. I was invited to do perform a wedding there. And uh, what a fancy shindig. Let me tell you something. Found out that the bottle of wine was $100 a bottle. And the bride and the groom were kind enough to invite me for dinner. And the steak and everything was just absolutely fabulous. Of course, when you're paying a couple hundred dollars for a plate of food, it better be fabulous. And um, the waiter came around and said, Sir, would you like a glass of wine? I said, Yep, absolutely. Boy, that was some good stuff. But uh, sorry, I'm not going to spend a day's pay for a bottle of wine. But, you know. But, uh, yeah, I don't drink much. Very, very, very little. All right, listen to this. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, Naked and ye clothed me, I was sick, and ye visited me, I was in prison, and ye came unto me. And then the people asked, Lord, when were you naked, and we clothed you, and you were sick, and we visited, and you were in prison? And Jesus said that whatever you did, well, the Bob paraphrased, whatever you did to the least of these people, you did unto me. Because we are all one in Christ. So, Philippians 1.10, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without, without offense till the day of Christ. See, the day of the Lord is for the wicked. But the day of Christ, which is the same event, is the day of our salvation. 
Philippians 2.16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. 2 Thessalonians 2.2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus. Okay, there's only one second coming. And by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ, the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, the second coming, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Boy, we're there. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. We're talking about the Antichrist. We're talking about what John in the book of Revelation called the beast. And that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, people, they're going to tell you that this happened in 70 AD, just prior to the temple being destroyed. Impossible. Did Christ come back? No. In the first chapter of Acts, the apostles were looking at Christ as he was taken up into heaven in the clouds. And an angel asked him, what are you guys doing? You know, what are you guys doing? Well, maybe we should read that. All right, let's read Acts chapter 1. Verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up until the day he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible infallible proofs having been seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Don't leave, guys. But wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but he, but ye, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And this happened at uh, Pentecost when the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit came upon them, right? Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he, Christ, said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken those things, while they beheld, he, Christ, he was taken up. He was taken up. He was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, angels, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee. So here it is, these angels are saying, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye up gazing up into heaven? What are you guys doing, you know, looking up into heaven, staring up into space? Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, 
shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In the way that you saw him go up, he's going to come back. Let's read that again. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Wow. All right, let's go take a look. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. John wrote the book of Revelation. By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course. The revelation, and revelation means to reveal. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now remember something. Uh, people will read this, oh, shortly must come to pass. Well, that meant 70 AD. You know, when you're talking about God's perspective of time, uh, shortly come to pass, well, what does that mean? Well, Peter tells you what shortly come to pass may mean. 2 Peter 3.8 But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Shortly come to pass could be a day or two with the Lord. A couple thousand years. People say, oh, well, 2,000 years. That doesn't mean shortly come to pass. Well, if you're talking in human terms of time, yeah. But if you're talking in time with the Lord's perspective, a thousand years is like a day to him. So when it says shortly come to pass, think about it. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified, sig, excuse me, signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth. Do you know you're blessed if you read this? Yeah, it says right here. I believe it. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. Wow. That's some heavy stuff. Verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Listen to this carefully. Behold, he, Christ, behold, he cometh with clouds. Remember in Acts it said you saw him go up into the clouds and he's going to come in like manner? Oh yeah. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Uh, did your eye see Christ come with the clouds? Uh, me neither. So when you get some guy called a preterist telling you that this happened in 70 AD, they're, they're fools or deceivers or both. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Well, you haven't seen him and neither have I, so this has not happened yet. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Believers are not going to be wailing. 
The unbelievers are going to be wailing. Believers are going to be going, praise the Lord, because our redemption draweth nigh. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who am who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, trouble, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. According to legend and tradition, they tried to kill John and they couldn't do it. So they had to exile him. I don't know how true that is, but they were killing believers back in the day. And why would they exile him to the Isle of Patmos? I mean, you know, it may be true. I don't know. Verse 10. I, John, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, the day of the Lord. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and give unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And let me tell you something, people. All those, uh, some of these churches are in what is modern day Turkey. Turkey used to be called Greece until the Ottoman Turks, those peaceful Muslims, came and killed all the Christians and took over the territory. And then they renamed it Turkey. So, yeah. And the Lord had some things to say about Laodicea and they were not very happy about it. So they didn't want to, uh, they did not want the book of Revelation in to be considered uh, in the canon of Scripture. They wanted to leave the book of Revelation out of the Bible. So, so I hope you understand the day of the Lord is judgment upon the wicked and the day of Christ will be our salvation and resurrection. We will be given new bodies. We will neither hunger nor thirst anymore. No more pain. And the Lord will wipe away all tears from our eyes. That is what we have to look forward to. We're not going to get old and have pains and aches and pains and no more arthritis and none of that stuff. So, I hope you found this enlightening. And the next time you hear somebody tell you that uh, the day of the Lord and the day of Christ is two different events, well, yeah, it is kind of, but it's at the same time. The day of the Lord is for unbelievers and the day of Christ is for those that are his sheep. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Oh yeah. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.